Now we go into the big debate, which is the main part of our uh, morning uh, session. Uh, let me explain how it works. Uh, we have two teams uh, of people uh, coming from the business world. Um, each, teams, each team with two speakers who will put their case for team A or against team B. Uh, the motion, which is, the motion is exactly the following. This assembly believes that thanks to digital technology, everyone can become a successful entrepreneur. Basically, this, this debate is about whether digital technology is the key to entrepreneurship or whether other things are also needed, are also uh, necessary to succeed. Uh, at, listen carefully because at the end of the debate, I will ask the audience for a vote. You will vote using your app. I think you already um, able to do so. Um, so let me introduce the, the speakers. I, will, I have on my right, team A, made up of those who will speak for the motion. Um, please welcome Tina Van Herikosa, which is, uh, she's a CEO uh, to Blink to Blinked, and Ilya Lors um, of GetJar, exactly. <laughs> and on my left, uh, the team B against uh, the motion. Um, please welcome uh, Orla Carmody of uh, mediatraining.ie uh, and uh, Amit Pau of Ariadne Capital. Thank you to you all. And I will start with Tina, if you, if you like. Uh, we, you have 12 minutes each. Yeah, okay? I know. Be strict. You Thank can speak wherever you are. I can to the, okay. to the lectern on uh, whatever you that's, like. I think that's for or against. I think it's. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. This is an Italian lectern. Sorry for that. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, to be in the audience today and to listen to my speech for the motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman Polito, to give me the floor. Welcome my opponents and uh, my partner, Ilya. Um, first, um, I promised home that my family and my colleagues, that I keep them posted about what I'm doing here in Naples. So I want to ask you to keep smiling. So I am going to make a photo and send it by WhatsApp to my family, if you don't mind. <laughs> Digital technology. OK. Thank you very much. So, as a Dutch entrepreneur, uh, owner of two companies, Blink to Be Linked and Refreshen, and the mother of four teenagers, I'm really busy. I'm uh, keeping um, my family posted by WhatsApp, doing my business by iPhone, email, uh, FaceTime, Skype and keeping in touch with my friends and family by Facebook, Instagram, etc., etc. So, that sounds great, do you think? Um, I think my mother wished in, when she was my age that she could all combine it like we can do in this digital technology uh, period. Uh, as an uh, entrepreneur, last year I was in Litauer um, at the SME 2013. I presented there the Dutch program, uh, an inspiration program to inspire young people with all kinds of backgrounds and all kinds of education to be an entrepreneur. Um, this year I was part of the jury to elect the best project, Dutch project, uh, they are on stage tonight for the European uh, Enterprise Promotion Award. Hope one or two of them will win. 
And now I'm here on stage to defend the motion, thanks to digital technology, everyone can be a successful entrepreneur. And I will tell you why. Um, before the rise of the digital, before the rise of the digital technology, there were many, many barriers to become a successful entrepreneur. These barriers have been removed by the advent of digital technology. As an entrepreneur, nowadays you are freed of obstacles to develop research, finance, markets, and sell your products cheaply, easily, and quickly. Computer and mobile technology has been adopted by customers and potential investors with great enthusiasm all over the world even in less uh, well-developed parts of the world. So entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs who do not understand the possibilities of digital technology or do not employ it, at the best, they will have lower profit margins uh, and they reduce their ability to prof provide first-class customer service. And at worst, it will effective, effectively prevent their enterprise from prospering. A great example of an entrepreneur, thanks to digital technology, is Nelden, a Dutch entrepreneur who launched WeTransfer, I think you all know, five years ago. He told me he was rather irritating, of irritated a couple of years ago that it was not possible to send big files from A to B. How simple can that be? With no hassle, no stress, no charge. Today, WeTransfer is a global exhibition of creative talents mixed with beautiful ads, all bootstrapped and growing rapidly. Another successful SME thanks to digital technology is Jolink.com. It's a Dutch name. So, Jolene is a talent Dutch fashion designer. She decided to launch her label online by D digital technology and started a web shop, creating a lot of exposure. She's doing so well and her business is growing very, very fast. So every entrepreneur is a digital entrepreneur nowadays with new and emerging technology set to enable innov innovative businesses to create up to 10 million new jobs for young people amongst the world's G20 countries, according to a new report by Accenture. The report said that the rise of digital technologies was paying, paving the way for the emergence of the digital entrepreneur, accompanied, accompanied by a new large-scale, open, innovative culture, which had the potential to open up 10, 10 million jobs for young people in the G20 nations. Large-scale open innovation is boosted by the rise of new digital technologies, which support participation by a large number of geographically dispersed participants and, pre and provide opportunities to create new business models. In fact, every entrepreneur now is a digital entrepreneur, and many of them are focusing on their innovation efforts on the so-called sharing economy. Business models that heavily use digital platforms to enable consumers and businesses to actively share and exchange accesses, access products and services to mutual benefits. According to the OACD research, firms of five years old or younger generated nearly half of all new jobs created in the, in the past decade, while accounting for only about 20% of non-financial businesses sectors employment. During the global financial crisis, most of the jobs destroyed were the result of established businesses downsizing, while net job growth in young firms remained positive. The extensive survey found that 83% of, re of the respondents said that they believed that innovation, particularly technology-driven innovation, was vital to grow their business and create jobs. At the, heart of, at the heart of entrepreneurs' innovation and economic competi competi 
competitiveness, you understand? Competitiveness, like digital technologies such as social media, mobile computing, cloud computing, big data, and the emerging internet of things. Emerging in the past five years, these technologies are now reaching a critical mass. In the process, they are having a significant, a significant impact on businesses in all industries. As companies focus on new ways, they can weave these technologies into the next generation of their business strategies. strategies sorry. Open innovation driven by digital technology is a key enabler. Welcoming co collaboration with large companies, customers, research and development institutes, incubators and accelerators, non-profit organizations and other startups. So my conclusion is when you really want to become a successful entrepreneur nowadays, you have to understand the meaning and the profits of digital technology and use it in the right way and of course offer good products and services. If so, there are no barriers to be a successful entrepreneur. So I think you all must agree with me that thanks to the digital technology, everybody who wants to be an entrepreneur can become a successful entrepreneur. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, Tina. Thank you. Now the floor to the team B who will argue that the growth of digital technology is not enough to produce successful entrepreneurs and um, uh, Orla Carmody of mediatraining.ie, please. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, I want you to imagine in your mind's eye the map of Europe. I want you to look at Europe and think about, think about it. And look way over to the left of Europe, what's over there on the left. No, that's my left, your left is actually that way. Look to your left and what is over there? Well, it's my island of Ireland. And way out to the left again is the county of Mayo. There's a beautiful coastline called the Wild Atlantic Way. Very, very pic picturesque. And in that little place is Belmullet. Population, thousand, thousand people are thereabouts. And that little village, that little hamlet, could fall off the edge of the island. Next up, Boston. And in that place, there are lots of little businesses, as you would imagine. A butcher, a pharmacist, there's a financial advisor, there's a few interesting businesses as well. There's some manufacturing small businesses as well. And what does that little place have in common with wherever you are from in Europe? So if you're from Bremen or Barcelona or Berlin, what do the businesses there have in common? with those little businesses in that little extremity of Europe. Well, they've one thing actually, and that is they were started by one person. One day, some man, some woman, had that light bulb moment, ping, when they decided that they would set up this business and offer this product or this service. And they were very excited to think that there were customers out there. There were people who would actually buy that product or service and they would be in business. So if it's a tiny business, a micro business, employing three or four people, or it's a massive business employing thousands. They have that one thing in common. And the really interesting thing about when those businesses started is that after that idea, after that light bulb moment, they got their friends involved. They became enthusiastic. They told people about this business. And a few people came on board to follow the idea, to go on the journey with them. And that's really when the enterprise was born. That light bulb moment and the people that come involved. That is probably the definition of entrepreneurship. Creating a meaningful business out of the raw materials of people, ideas, and customers. Doesn't say anything in there about technology, because technology is just a tool. Technology is something that you, you can't eat. You can't eat technology. You can't feel technology. You can't love technology, unless you're a very sad person and you have no life at all. And the fact that you're here, that you're with me, I think you might agree with me, you're not those sad people. You're very committed and passionate about entrepreneurship, about startups, about small business, and about what this can do for Europe, for our future, for the future of all of us. And I think you're also committed maybe to the idea of young people and giving those young people, our precious young people, 
giving them the opportunity to really find themselves and to contribute to the economy of Europe as it goes forward, that the legacy we leave them, they will take forward and do more with it than we did. Isn't that the greatest dream you can have, that they will do more than you did? Do you remember when you were at school, and it's not that long ago, when your teachers told you, work hard, study hard, pass your exams, get qualified, go to college, and get a job? Somebody will bestow this job upon you. Well, I don't think we can say that to our young people anymore. It's gone. We have to say to our young people, find a customer, not a job. Because if young people can grow or make or build or design or draw or produce or fabricate or construct anything at all, and somebody wants to buy it, they're in business. And when you get your first customer, it's very exciting, very exciting indeed. And then if you get five customers, you begin to think, you know what, this is getting really interesting. And then you get 10 customers and you know you're onto something and you start phoning the VCs. We're ready to go, we're going to scale. And how exciting and fantastic must that be for our young people? Imagine to think that we could give them that notion that their ideas, their attitude, their skill, their resilience, their ambition, would be so valued by the world that somebody is prepared to buy it and pay them the money that allows them to go off and do their ski holidays or their windsurfing or whatever it is they want to do. And I think about these things rather a lot because, like my colleague, it's the one thing we do have in common. I'm a mother of four teenagers as well. I did my bit for Europe. So, I think about these things a lot. And I obviously think about the interplay between Government, education, personal responsibility, societal factors, all the things that we put into what we call the entrepreneurial ecosystem. If we create the right entrepreneurial ecosystem, we can allow these young people who will flourish and who will take the thing forward. There's a former education minister I know of who had a delegation one day from some entrepreneurial educators. And they were saying to the minister, you know, we need to spend money on entrepreneurial education. And he was saying, well, I have no budget. And anyway, he said, it's not very important. Not very important. That's extraordinary. There's a study that has come out of Denmark recently, and it's absolutely fascinating, where they looked at primary school children, and they gave them entrepreneurial classes. And after the entrepreneurial classes, sure, the youngsters learned about entrepreneurship. But what was extraordinary was that their attitude, their ambition, their management of their personal time all kinds of things changed as well for the better. And the effects of the training carried right on into their secondary education and up into their third level where they become more entrepreneurial. So this is what we're finding, that entrepreneurial education is life skills education. And the teachers, the educators who went into that government minister, get this. They understand that entrepreneurial education is not necessarily the nuts and the bolts, the technology, the how to find the funding. All of that's terribly, terribly important. But what it really is about is the behavioral skills, because it is those behavioral skills that will allow them to progress. And those educators are seeing when they offer behavioral skills as part of entrepreneurial education, they see lots more students coming into those classes. And interestingly, they see a lot more female students coming into those classes and they see those students coming out of those classes really confident in the fact that one day they will and they can set up a business. The, the educational factors are only part of it. Obviously, there are government and policy and all kinds of other factors that need to go in to create this entrepreneurial eco ecosystem. And one of the things I would say to governments that they seriously need to do is to take the red tape out of accessing the kind of supports that I know are there. There's a lot of effort been putting into creating these supports, but let's take the red tape out of accessing them. Let's make them more transparent, easier to get to. And also I think governments need to think about taking the punishment out of being an entrepreneur. And by that I mean in my country you could spend your whole lifetime paying taxes and maybe, and working until the age of say 50, and maybe at that point you decide to set up a business. Well, if that business fails, you're on your own. That lifetime of welfare payments is gone. So you have 30 employees and 29 of them will have that window of support they need. And the 30th one, the owner of the business, the person who set it all up and took the risk, does not have any support. Now, I'm not advocating a greater welfare state, of course not. But I'm saying there needs to be a window of opportunity for that person. 
to dust themselves off when they fail and get up and go again. And if we believe in the kind of education that I'm talking about, they will do that because they have the skills to do so. The other thing we need to create that entrepreneurial system I'm talking about, the ecosystem, is of course access to finance. Now we have a system of microfinance whereby it's, it's a loan of last resort. So if you have been turned down by the banks, and there's many people in that situation, as you know, because of what has befallen us with the recession, there are people who are carrying rump debt, so therefore they can't access finance. So this is a loan of last recourse. But unfortunately, this scheme, very well intentioned, is not rolling the finance, finance out as fast as it should do. There's a lot of obstacles to it. One of them is, and this is only anecdotal, please don't quote me on it, but I heard that the 12-person board of the credit committee of this microfinance, well, actually, they're all male. Now, I don't know who thought that was a good idea. And also, they're all former bankers who thought that was a good idea. It's not normal banking criteria that's needed. It's somebody with a business head who understands somebody needs to be given the opportunity to start up and go again. So access to finance from the small right all the way up is so important. Peer-to-peer -peer support is another element that is hugely important. I belong to the Entrepreneurs Organization, a worldwide organization going for about 25 years now, 10,000 members. And since I joined it in the last year, I have had access to incredible support. My cohort, my group, we meet every month and we exchange our business ideas. It's a bit like having your private and personal non-executive board of directors, which is hugely important as an entrepreneur because it's a lonely place being an entrepreneur, plowing that furrow on your own or a startup. It's a lonely place and you need access to support from others. So organizations like that are hugely impactful. And mentoring, of course, mentoring. We must give back, we must give. Those of us who are here who are interested in this space, have you given a lecture recently in a school or a college? Have you offered your services in some way? That's entrepreneurial citizenship. And Professor Cooney, if you're here, yes, I will do that guest lecture for you. And no, I won't charge you my usual large fee. But that's what we need to think about. We need to think about entrepreneurial give back as well, to pass on our information, to put the hand out and bring the others up on the ladder behind us. Internships. I'm coming up to my, my, my wrap-up point, so I'll finish up on this point. Internships are hugely important as well. We have a job bridge scheme where an intern comes and works with you for six months or, or nine months and gets their supports and a little top-up as well. And there's a certain element of the media and indeed the, uh, the, the, the talking public who are very critical of it where I live. And it's, they, they suggest that employers are maybe exploiting young people. But interestingly, the Department of Jobs and Enterprise commissioned a forum on entrepreneurship, and it was headed up by Sean O'Sullivan, a, a, an extraordinary Irish entrepreneur. He's the man who in the 90s coined the phrase cloud computing. And he headed up this forum, and it, it came up with some amazing findings. But one of the ones they suggested about Jobbridge was not that it should be doubled or tripled, but that it should be increased 20-fold, that internships are a way of actually getting people motivated and energized to be the kind of, of, of um, entrepreneurs and startups we want that will drive our economy forward. So to finish up, whether you are from Belmullet or Bergen or Barcelona or wherever, whatever size of business you might be engaged in, I believe that technology will allow you to scale and grow. There's no doubt about that. It will allow you to burst out onto the world stage. It will allow you to attract all those glitzy financiers who might take your business very quickly to the next level. But unless we have the ducks in a row, as I've described, I really don't think anybody will become an entrepreneur. So I will go absolutely against the motion that entrepreneurship or that uh, technology, with technology, everybody can become a successful entrepreneur. No, technology is a tool with the right attitudes, behaviours and all of the other things I've mentioned, then you will become an entrepreneur. And please do. Thank you. Very good shot for Team B. Now your opportunity from Team A, Yellows or Gedjar. Hello, everybody. 
Uh, it's really great to see you all here. And uh, before the discussion, I thought it's a, it's a funny position that we have to take with my partner because we're going to prove actually something that is really evident, self-evident itself. But I thought I'd, I'd, I'd maybe illustrate a little bit, maybe give a little bit more insight into how digital economy, digital media, digital products are, are really changing the life, not only of people, but of entrepreneurs and how it really enables uh, uh, one-man shops, guys sitting somewhere in Lebanon or Finland or any part of the world, to really effectively compete with the biggest corporations. So I really, as a businessman, a practical guy, I like numbers because they don't lie. They just state merely the facts. So I was lucky to spend five years, uh, last my five years of my life in Silicon Valley building a company there. And I have a lot of respect for the uh, ecosystem that Silicon Valley was able to create for uh, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs. And namely, uh, Stanford University is really responsible for a lot of innovation. Funny enough, uh, I, when you talk to Silicon Valley natives, they say, well, we're lucky because we are the only place on the planet which is not building Silicon Valley. <laughs> So it really shows something. Uh, every single country that I know is trying to uh, really learn something from them. But just facts. Just Stanford University students, students have raised $4.1 billion in funding to fund their new businesses just in the last four years. That's over a billion dollars a year for students just to form the innovative business. Uh, just to give you a sense of scale, uh, every single year, uh, only 8,000 students actually uh, join the university. So it's not that many people. Now, since founding of Stanford University, 40,000 companies have been built by Stanford University students only. 40,000 companies. Now, those companies today account for 5.4 million jobs. Highly paid jobs yielding as much as, I will repeat that number twice, $2.7 trillion in annual revenue. $2.7 trillion in annual revenue. And this is just Stanford University. Apparently there are more famous universities in the US and outside the US, but uh, I think you cannot argue with those numbers. I, I think they are apparently showing that single men shops young companies, entrepreneurs, students are responsible for a lot of innovation that's coming to our lives. After the facts, apparently, you know, they're abstract, they are maybe hard to see, uh, uh, but look at the best known companies that have been built in the, in the world in the last 10 years. You know, you have no doubt that you immediately think of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Google, Apple. If you really ask yourself, you know, how it was built, was it really a spin-off of, you know, some weird, big, like, you know, General Motors, whatever, like 100 years old corporation? No, not at all. Like, all of these companies have been built by single or, 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 or small teams of entrepreneurs. And uh, in our digital world, really the big difference, what is being made today, what enables those kind of companies to really grow to those kind of sizes, is the mere fact that no longer, no longer land or machinery really is relevant to the business. If you really think of the history of the humankind since you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and apparently initially the one who owned the land really had the job and, and you know, could earn the money. Later it was apparently industrial revolution, it was machinery, it was factories, etc. So without those apparently as entrepreneur, I mean you just couldn't earn anything because you had to rely on those resources. And right now, if I'm a student, zero financial back, sitting somewhere in the dorm, I have access to the same technology, same Amazon Clouds, Microsoft Clouds, Google Clouds, that those guys are using. I can build a resource, I can build a product, a service. Again, without asking anybody, without going anywhere, without investing anything, I can build a product that hundreds of millions of people can use worldwide. Just to illustrate, just to give you again some facts, hard facts. Uh, I started almost a joke. A couple of years ago, I was lucky to be visiting a Davos World Economic Forum and sitting on a panel discussion. And to my left was head of China Telecom. And apparently the big country, big industrial country, uh, with a lot of people. And at some point, uh, you know, this guy goes like, hey, you no, know, 
we're like the world's like largest corporation. We have 600 million users. Stop that. And the moderator, I mean, he was an American, he says, oh, that's not bad at all. Like that's almost as much as Facebook has. Because at that point, Facebook had 700 million people. So China Telecom, huge country, big corporation, this big corporate guy has less users than Facebook has. I mean, many of you probably have seen the social network movies, so many of you have kind of uh, at least knowledge of how it all started in, 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 in the university. And again, ask yourself, uh, is it something that would be possible without the digital technology? Would somebody in the world alone, sitting in the student dorm, be able to reach that kind of number of people that probably none of the traditional businesses has ever seen? Answer is none. It's only the digital technology. Again, this is key property, zero marginal cost. Zero marginal cost to anything. If you put something, it's as easy to sell or to bring to one guy as it is to a billion guys worldwide. You don't have, I mean, there is no friction, there is no overhead, so it's pure thought, pure creativity, pure idea. Uh, it's that now really dominates the world. And again, if you ask yourself, you know, what's different, you know, what differs a humankind from, you know, any other creature on the planet, it says it's creativity, it's a brain, it's capacity to think of things. And now, again, thanks specifically to digital technology, we're at the point where you can sell pure thought, where no longer you need the land to grow the crops or you rely on seasons or anything, no longer you need machinery or factories, uh, it's not relevant any longer. You know, to sell your digital idea, digital product, again, you do not have to invest anything. You can build yourself a the product. You can use the latest technology, the clouds, the internet, you know, the app stores themselves, or, or something similar to immediately, day one, reach hundreds of millions of people worldwide and start earning. So again, just to give you my background story, I didn't really introduce myself initially. Uh, last, I mean, I launched my own business 2005-ish uh, in Lithuania, the country that probably would, would nobody really would think as, as, as a you know, sort of Silicon Valley or a country where a lot of innovation comes from, but I, I'm a proud country, uh, coming from that country. And uh, we bootstrapped the company. We did not take any external money or funding or external resources. And three years into, into the business, uh, uh, we already were valued double digit millions and we already started to work with Silicon Valley tier one investors and a couple years later, we're a triple digit million company. Lithuanian guy, couple years after, you know, Soviet Union breaking, you know, in a garage, literally starting a business and then just in five years, you know, reaching that kind of scale, I think it would not be possible again without the digital. Because I, give, I think it gives equal chances to everybody, whether you are in Lithuania or Silicon Valley or Finland or elsewhere, to uh, uh, compete on the same grounds. Again, no longer that distance or difference or background matters. You can really achieve what you are really striving for. And to finish up, again, a couple of illustrations, just, just insights, again, illustrations of the guys that I personally know that are single men shops single men shops that I've worked with and respect a lot and just to illustrate, you know, how we can really, in just months, you know, achieve something really big. So there is one guy in Lebanon, Paul, 24 years old. His product is one of the most successful applications ever, reaching 80 million people. He doesn't even have really a company, he just, you know, does what he likes. Tony, a guy in Finland, 700 kilometers north of Helsinki. I don't know if you've ever you know, been uh, that kind of far in Europe, uh, running one of the most successful racing games, Hill Camp Racing. You know, he earns double digit millions a, a year just of this uh, racing game and he has fun just because he likes what he's doing. Uh, Do, a guy who created, I don't know many of you probably have seen or played the funny game called Fluffy Birds. Uh, it was really super popular maybe like a year ago or something. And the guy was so successful that he at some point says, hey, no, I'm closing the whole game, I'm, I'm removing the whole thing because I cannot bear the success because I'm earning $50,000 a day and that's more than my imagination can handle so I'm just like closing the whole thing and, and that's it. Again, a couple of insights, what stands behind those like billions and billions of numbers that I mentioned in my beginning of the speech. Again, think of WhatsApp, you know, 17 billion sales to Facebook. Sky created in Estonia, my neighbor country. 8.5 billion dollars sold to Microsoft. Instagram, 
you know, like, like, like a very little application sold for a billion dollars to, again, Facebook. So when you think of those and you really know who is behind those, you say, hey, you know, uh, uh, again, no longer we need all this like machinery, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera things. Of course, it's very important. I'm not saying that, that it, I mean, it, I'm not trying to devalue it at all, but what I'm trying to say and illustrate, and this is the thesis of this debate, is that digital is changing the name of the game completely. No longer it's a land on machinery or factories or investment or resources or anything. It's pure creativity that now gets solved. And every single body, every, every, everybody in this room, outside this room, in the world, has access to the same resources that actually are free, essentially. Again, if you use in Amazons or, or Google Clouds, you don't have to even pay for that. It's, it's all free. You have the same tools, access the same technology to, that the big corporations have. Therefore, you compete, again, on the quality of a product as opposed to anything else. So I think it's self-evident. And again, I'm, I'm happy to give you some insights and illustrations into, into how actually it's, it's done in, in, in my world, in the real world. So thank you. Thank you, Ilya. Now, our next spe uh, last speaker, Amit Pau, Ariad Capital for uh, Team B, against the motion. Good morning, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, distinguished guests. Fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen, it's a deep honor and a privilege to be here with you. Blink and we miss it. We're glued to te digital technology. As a consumer, I've got my iPhone, I've got my tablet. With two teenage daughters, we don't have the first second screen. The TV isn't the second screen. This is the first screen, this is the second screen, the laptop's the third, and maybe somebody looks at these devices. But it's not about technology. And let me explain why. In minutes, 2011, London riots took place through social media. Arab Springs took place. But this is all about entrepreneurship and not wider digital application. So entrepreneurship, Airbnb, WhatsApp, Uber, brilliant companies that have been created overnight. So you may say, I'm supporting my fellow colleagues with their motion that digital allows everybody to be a successful entrepreneur. Completely wrong. There are a number of aspects, as Orla mentioned, about the ecosystem. And I'll pick four or five very, very quickly to go through. The first is, it's the power of business model. Technology is an enabler. Yes, it's commoditized. Yes, open standards means that everybody can write software. But guess what? Great companies and great entrepreneurs are not about technology. It's about business models. Apple, the company that almost went bankrupt, how did they become such the most valuable company today? It's not because they had the coolest technology. They consumerized it. But the legendary Steve Jobs transformed the business model of the music industry. He disrupted with the music industry. He disrupted the mobile operators. I could go through Google, but WhatsApp, so I'm glad that my colleagues are actually supporting our debate. You know, what's the power of WhatsApp? Yes, it's cool and I've got my numbers on here, but that's not it. This is a business that in four and a half years has got half a billion customers, and I had the privilege of being on the Vodafone board and Vodafone UK, uh, UK boards. Four and a half years, half a billion customers. That's why I say you blink and you miss it. Vodafone, a great company, 25 years old, today only has 400 million customers, 411. But the genius isn't the WhatsApp technology. The genius that WhatsApp have done is that they have disrupted the mobile operators. They've changed the business model. I don't need to own the network. I don't need to own the infrastructure. I don't need to own the customer care. I don't need to pay subsidies. I let the consumer, by giving them a service with a powerful business model, destroy ex existing businesses. The same with Airbnb. The accidental entrepreneurs who converted a loft now have a market cap greatest than intercontinental hotels. So it's about the business model. But even with the business model, entrepreneurship, you know, what makes great entrepreneurs? 
It's not about cool technology. It's not just about the business model. You've got to have a market. The market has got to be validated. It's got to be able to scale. Now, Europe has more entrepreneurship programs than the US, if we go across the pond, uh, you know, as I refer to in the UK. 260 different entrepreneurship programs were launched across Europe compared to only 200 in the US. But why are we a laggard in Europe? It's access to capital. We, Europe does not have the capital. And all, when it does have the capital, the venture industry in Europe is risk adverse. It's quite crazy, because bear in mind, venture capital is all about taking risks. Why do I say Europe is lagging behind on the venture industry? 2012, Europe venture capitalists companies like ourselves raised just over 3 billion. That's a 52% drop from 2007. Now I'm going to be slightly controversial because in, I think it was May when we had the recent European elections, in a number of countries, the UK, France, there was an anti-Europe vote. The European Commission and the European Investment Fund has allocated at 40% of the European investment funds to European entrepreneurs. Just imagine if we didn't have that investment from the European Investment Fund. Europe would not only be a laggard, the developing markets would be further ahead. So I thank those people in Brussels for the, Euro and, you know, the European Investment Fund. The other aspect, which I think it's not just about capital, it's also about you know, regulation. Why does regulation matter? I'll explain why. I was in Johannesburg in March, and then in Lagos and Abuja in July, speaking to entrepreneurs who were launching an IT hardware manufacturing business, and they were going to the US, not Europe. And I asked them why. You know, Europe has a bigger market. You know, Africa, French speaking, surely you should be coming to Europe, Germany. And they said, Amit, you're a fool if you think there's such a thing as Europe. Regulation. In some countries in Europe, I can set up business in less than 10 days. In other parts of Europe, it takes more than 80 days. I urge Europe, cut less, cut the bureaucracy, cut the red tape, but have for business a single regulatory framework. Without that regulatory framework, a single regulatory framework, Europe's entrepreneurial cre creativity will be inhibited, without a doubt. And I'm not a politician, by the way, and I have no politicians. The, the other one which is then going to get into the real controversy and spice, immigration. Why did we have such a backlash in the, in the UK? Benefit tourism. That's just ridiculous. You know, 65% of Fortune 100 company CEOs, do you know what they have in common? They're either first generation or second generation immigrants. You know, so those people who are voting anti-immigration, you're killing entrepreneurship. Second stat, which is really important. This year alone, in the US, 50% of venture capital investment has gone into companies whose CEOs and founders are either Asian or Chinese. So I was having this discussion with guests coming from the airport yesterday, and they were saying, well, I'm at, you know, it's about picking the right type of immigrants. So I said, how do I select those right type of immigrants? By the way, I was born in Kenya as a British passport holder. I view myself as Indian, American, and then British, and I can explain why after I. So why am I passionate about immigration? Great companies are built by great immigrants, by the way, and Europe's got this opportunity. But the other reason, when we talk about digital technology, I use the, I don't know how many of you have heard of a city in, Le in England called Leicester? Uh, one or two. Leicester was renowned for shoes and socks, textile. Population of 320,000 circa. Do you know which city in the UK for the last two years has had the highest sales of Bentleys? And Bentleys are not as cool as Ferraris, but the average starting price of a Bentley is 200,000 euros. Leicester, not a digital company, an industry, 
And what happened? 40 years ago, 35 years ago, you had British Asians who left Africa to come to the UK. It's not London where the Ferraris are being bought. It's not stockbreaker belt investment bankers. It's people who were entrepreneurs who built old-fashioned retailers, manufacturing businesses that are creating that 85% growth of jobs. And then, you know, I'm conscious I can carry on with more stats which are really, really important. I'm, I'm going to try to get this quote, culture. And it's a quote from Peter Thiel, which I think is really important. So Peter Thiel is the founder of PayPal, uh, the first venture capitalist to invest in Facebook. Now you can see I'm really not truly of the digital generation carrying devices and having to use multiple flips. Peter Thiel <sighs> referred to Europe as a slacker with low expectations, held back by a poor work ethic of its people and run by politicians that strangle technology progress with regulation that a cure worse than a disease. I actually find that quite offensive. But I've been very pro the EU on what they've been doing on investment uh, and having a single business policy. What is killing entrepreneurship in Europe is the working hours directive. Igor, you're talking about in Silicon Valley, if you want to be a start, if you want to be an entrepreneur, how many hours a week? 100 hours or so. I don't know what the rules are. You've got to work 35 hours a week, 40 hours a week, 45 hours. Trust me, great companies and great entrepreneurs aren't run in 40, 45 hour weeks. You've got to have a work-life balance. I understand that. But don't kill the entrepreneurs with, with regulation. Culture. The other two points I really touch on, you know, Europe or Brits, we're quite conservative. We don't like failure. In the US, it's a badge of honor that I've failed, yeah? Now, we have to change that. And a good example is Finland, you know? How many of us have played Angry Birds? Come on, a few more than that, yeah? Right, Angry Birds, 500 million downloads? So it's sort of whatever the numbers are, okay? The share price may not have done as well on the IPO. The parent company of Angry Birds, do you know how many failures they had? in this company. Angry Birds was their 51st project and only success. Yeah? So I now come back to wrapping up and I actually thank my colleagues who were opposing because the question was, if I recall right Mr. Chairperson, was in the digital age, digital technology allows everybody to be a successful entrepreneur. And the key word is it's digital technology. So I thank my colleagues for actually agreeing with me because you were saying it's about business models, the sharing economy. You were sharing the view that actually what uh, the Bob, was it Bob or Joe in Lebanon with 50, 50 million downloads? The gentleman in Lebanon, Mohammed, was only able to build that app because of the app store. Apple changed the business model, yeah? You know, yes, digital technology is a powerful enabler, but without having entrepreneurs who have a market, who can validate that market, who can commercially scale it without funding, having the entrepreneurial ecosystem in the context. And then the final one, which nobody has talked about, and you know, to wrap up, is the power of entrepreneurs. Not everybody is born to be an entrepreneur. And when I say not everybody's been born to be an entrepreneur, if we, we've been privileged to back seven game changers. Skype and Monetize are two examples. Nicholas came to our offices 2004 with only $5,000 left in his back pocket, and that was his personal money. He was willing to sacrifice his whole life to build a great business. How many entrepreneurs are willing, you know, can, how many people really want to sacrifice that? The other one is Alistair Lukey, Monetize, billion market cap. Alistair took him five years to get his first customer. And he sent us a text. And his text was, five years down the road, 198 meetings, 69 home, um, nights away from home, and 72 missed dates with my wife. I now have my first customer. Don't underestimate, not everybody is born to be an entrepreneur. Yes, technology is commoditizing, it makes it easier. But without having all of the ecosystem, 
the technology is just a small part. I thank you all very much. So I understand we, we should say our friends in Ferrari to open a retail in Leicester because there is a, there's a market over there <laughs> for big cars. Thank you. So we have finished uh, the presentation, the four uh, presentation of, uh, uh, from the two teams. Now we'll take a question from the audience. So it's your, it's your turn, it's your moment. Uh, everyone who wants to put forward questions for the speakers, please raise your hands and uh, we'll, uh, wait for a mic. Obviously, obviously, when you will get the, the mic, you have to identify yourself and your organization. Please. And the people who want to dress. Okay, um, let me ask you something, first of all. Uh, regulation is a key point of, uh, uh, from the, 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 the Team B against the, the motion. Uh, it's not so important with the technology, with digital technology business. It's less important than before. Red tape. We, we, we know something about this in Italy. Yes, no, I think again we have to go to the root of the question and says digital technology allows everyone to become. Of course it takes much more than the digital economy, otherwise we'll have like seven billion successful entrepreneurs on this planet, so this is nonsense. But the key word here is everyone. If I was to start a winery, because I just like producing wine, I wouldn't be able to. I don't have land, I don't have resources, I don't have access to grapes, et cetera, et cetera. This is a no starter for me, even though I'd love to be a wine entrepreneur, I love wine. I cannot, because it's not digital, where I can. So I think the key word here is really, uh, it's leveling the fear for every single human being on the planet. So are you in Africa with no resources? You're in Lebanon, you're in Finland, you're in Lithuania. Everybody is equal, everybody can. Of course, it doesn't, doesn't mean that you will. It would take 52 efforts for the Angry Birds and Peter Westerbacher, who is a good friend. So it actually is a 52, not 51. No, no, but it's public knowledge that it's 51. It just there is one hidden product that, <laughs> that never really reached the, the, the world. But again, I think what we have to really to say here is that Digital technology levels the field, enables every single one to participate on the same rules. I think that's the key, and that's what we're defending here. Okay. Tina, you want to add something to this? Uh, yes? You can speak. I totally uh, agree, of course. And uh, I think uh, everyone with all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of education, because the digital technology gives you access to all over the world. So internationalization, um, there are some criteria, uh, you have to speak your languages, you have to know the cultures, but digital technology is a very, very important uh, thing to be successful as an entrepreneur. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the audience? Please, uh, get the mic to... Your organization and your name, please. Grazie, sono... Thank you. Angelo Tortorelli, Presidente Angelo della Tortorelli, Camera di Commercio di Matera. President of the Matera Chamber of Commerce. Io ero, prima di questo dibattito, debate, avevo le idee molto chiare. I had very clear e ringrazio questo dibattito uh, per avermele in qualche uh, maniera I confuse. No, no, eh, a questo servono i dibattiti. Some confused ideas in my mind. Confuse well, in maniera positiva. Confused in a positive way. Anche perché ritengo fortemente, la, do, la mia domanda Because, è questa, uh, well, siamo in un paese, l'Italia, dove è fortemente radicata la cultura, la storia, quegli elementi che history. credo debbano essere aiutati in un momento tecnologico rispetto And, uh, al quale so siamo su, tutti quanti proiettati e siamo tutti quanti d'accordo. Però... Il valore umano in un paese come l'Italia, dove, ripeto, cultura, storia, tradizioni la fanno da padrone, come può essere in qualche maniera condivisa, e come sempre succede, trovare un punto di mediazione perché non solo la tecnologia 
ma anche le risorse umane debbano poter fare la loro parte? Grazie. Grazie. Eh, perdonatemi, prima di dare la risposta io vorrei eh, salutare il Presidente della Repubblica che deve andare via, ci deve lasciare, lo ringraziamo molto. We thank you, President, for uh, being here the whole morning and um, goodbye. <laughs> Grazie al Presidente, vorrei che l'idea... Thank you, President. Spero che, abbia, che il Presidente abbia gradito la, la vivacità del dibattito. Let me repeat that the President said that all the speakers are, are being very uh, clever and agree and brilliant as well. Thank you again, President. Have you, ever, have you ever spoke again in front of a president before? Actually, yes. <laughs> yes? <laughs> president of the United States or Ireland? Your, Your country. Okay. <laughs> okay. Back to your seat. So we, yeah, we wait for um, the audience to calm down. The, 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 the press pack is going, so this is very noisy press pack. I'm a journalist myself, so. <laughs> Suo nome? Tortorelli. You made a question about human resource, how we can combine tradition and new technology in a country like Italy, human resource, skills, skills. You want to ask? Good. Good. With this human um, question and answer session, at the end of it, we will have the vote, I, I warned you, so listen carefully. Uh, vorrei che you, you can answer maybe the question uh, put forward by Mr. Tortorelli, which is about skills. I mean, especially in Italy, where we have uh, a, great, a great tradition, uh, you know, of uh, human resource, of people working. I think you can speak. Uh, Hello? Am I switched on? Yeah, Thank yeah, you. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't gather the full question, but I, I, I understand it was about human resources and the link with human resources and technology. And just to touch on that, um, our human resource is our greatest value, as I, I, I outlined in my own talk. And I believe that we have to put the supports around our staff. And when we talk about the entrepreneurial skills in the education sense, that applies equally right across the board, because even if we educate young people to have these, they end up working for a corporate. Well, what's going to be looked for in the corporate world these days except entrepreneurial skills, because they are actually the same things. And that really is what uh, technology has done. It has changed the way we do business. It's changed the way things move so fast that the old-fashioned company where everything was done to a set pattern, a set way, and we've always done it that way, we've done it that way for the last 10 years, so why do it any way differently? That's gone. It's completely gone. It's all about thinking on our feet, being inventive, 
seeing the possibilities, making decisions fast, because the technology is just moving it on so fast. So the very skills I'm talking about apply regardless of where you actually end up working, whether you become an entrepreneur or you become an entrepreneur or you end up working wherever you do. And I think that's, that's the acknowledgement I like to see in resources and training. Um, I mentioned Sean O'Sullivan, a, a great Irish entrepreneur, and I heard him speaking recently, and he said he has a system in his businesses right across the globe that he gives every one of his staff members a budget of 2,000 euro per year to spend on training and development. It's all about lifelong learning, as we know these days. And any staff member who doesn't go and find that training for themselves has it taken away from them at the end of the year. And people hate losing things. So you have to spend your budget, whether it is training in technology or training in leadership or development or communication skills or whatever the training might be, but that he is actually putting that emphasis on training and development. And I think that's something we, we do have to look at and we have to put the resources into it. Thank you. And uh, what about combining tradition, you know, the old jobs with new technology? Is, is, have you... Uh, listen, I think we're a firm believer that the winners in today's society and tomorrow's society are those who understand existing businesses and leverages the enabling technology. So I'm just going to the motion. It says can, everybody can become a successful entrepreneur. It's not about commoditizing technology. It's about having all of the access. So I was in Poland last two weeks ago. You can get 50K of equity in Poland, but you can't scale your business because there's no Series A or Series B venture capital. In same in Africa. But to answer your question, e leveraging existing businesses, if you look at what's happened with taxis, the euphora on Uber that's going around, yeah. why doesn't the taxi industry fight back? I use flat cabs eight times a day for business. When I leave business dinners, why do I use Uber or my private mini cab firm? Because it's half the price of flat cab. The black cabs could utilize that technology to say, okay, Amit's in the West End, he lives in Northwood, I'm on my way home, I'll give him a ride and I'll pay a bit more. That's one example. The second one is um, iPads. We talk about existing businesses. So there's a gentleman, very few people may have heard of him, it's a company called Snuggate, Snugcase. They're the number two seller of accessories for an iPad. And the, the founder is an 82-year-old who can't read or write. He's dyslexic. And I, I stress that because I'm dyslexic and I'm really proud of being very dyslexic. He knows nothing about technology. He was in New York taking his grandchildren out um, holidays. And he couldn't understand why for three days running on the launch of the iPad, why people were queuing outside the Apple store. So on the fourth day, as an 82-year-old, he went into the store and bought all his grandchildren some children, 10 iPads. And the kids said, Grandpa would like an, a case, accessory. There was no accessories left. So he said to the store, Apple store manager, why? And he said, well, Mr. Smith, we sold out of accessories in the first half hour. So what did Mr. Smith do? The 82-year-old who knows nothing about... Sorry. The 82-year-old who knows nothing about technology is just an importer and an exporter. Yeah? Calls technology using an old-fashioned, not mobile, landline. Calls his suppliers in China. Can somebody source me accessories? If so, I will buy the largest volume. That's an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur takes risks. <laughs> yeah? They take their risks. It's not about the technology is an enabler. Yeah? Yeah. So absolutely, the great businesses, because the, the existing businesses, the old economy, the traditional, whatever labels we want to do, they understand customers, they understand processes, they understand cash flow, and if you enable them with technology, and I use the word enable them, they can grow their businesses and fight back and become high growth companies, not three, four digit, three, four percent growth companies. So absolutely fantastic opportunity. Okay, very good point. Any other question from the audience? Yes. One, two. First two, yeah, start you. Um, please, your name and organization. Alberto Marchioni, incaricato politiche comunitarie e confcommercio imprese per l'Italia. Alberto Marchioni. Ovviamente la versione più vicina al mondo che noi rappresentiamo, la versione B, avendo apprezzato anche il 
la, rapp la rappresentanza eh, ha manifestato una serie di eh, problematiche che eh, impediscono alla piccola impresa di eh, come dire, com essere competitiva, pressione fiscale, fisco eccetera. Ho sentito parlare poco di eh, lavoro in termini di eh, riforma, di eh, come dire, impedimento per, per l'impresa. Faccio un esempio banale. In Italia eh, si sta discutendo oggi di questa tematica. Eh, una, una micro, piccola, media impresa ha difficoltà oggi a pagare la tredicesima, la quattordicesima, il TFR, eh, permessi, vacanze, con una complicanza tipica del nostro paese. Ritenete che in Europa non ci debba, ci debba essere una versione come dire, unitaria che punti alla coesione per facilitare la competitività e quanto può incidere questo sulla, sulla, piccola, sulla micro, piccola e media impresa? Grazie. Yes, would you like to ask to answer this question is putting forward the, the point about uh, labor market regulation. Is it a key issue for, uh, you know, successful business in uh, digital technology? We have a very heated debate in Italy at the moment about a reform of the, the labor market rules and um, he was advocating for a unifying uh, Europe on, on this. You think it's important for small business? Uh, well, of course, as it has been mentioned here, uh, much more liberal environment is really very uh, helpful for innovation. Because the one fact is very true, entrepreneurship is about taking risks. You do not know whether something you built is going to work or it's not going to work. So taking risks is what entrepreneurship is about. Now, if you think of that, taking risks in terms of like labor regulations means hiring people, taking responsibility for the social protection, for the wages, you know, for the social security, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you are an entrepreneur, again, I'm not going into philosophical discussion where we're like labor regulated or social security high level is good or bad. I'm just stating that from entrepreneur perspective, the more difficult it is what they call in America hire and fire, the less risk I am willing to take, period. Because if I put a unit, a sales unit, and I hire 10 guys and my product fails, I need to be able to fire them, unfortunately, in the next three months. Because I only have so much venture capital in my company, and if I don't fire them, then my company gets broke, period. So the tougher regulations are, the less risk entrepreneurs are capable of taking. And because entrepreneurship is about risk taking, because you're building things that have never existed, you have no clue or it's going to work or not, how many people have to be there, et cetera, et cetera, the consequences are you're simply taking less risk. That means you're just not trying things, period. This is why in America, where liberal environment is you know, much, much, much higher than in Europe, there's so much more risk taking. Again, I'm not stating on the European philosophical level where it's bad or good. It's just one circumstance where I think regulations are, in a way, stopping innovation and entrepreneurship. Simple. Okay. Thank you. We have... Uh, one young guy here and then one younger la young lady at the end of the, the hall. Okay, and uh, one on this okay. side, okay. Three people for the moment, go on, yeah. go ahead. Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Mario Taroka, I'm 21 years old and I represent Jade and we represent uh, young entrepreneurs from all around Europe. My question is more focused on the second part of the debate, if you think that all the, all the youth people, all the people uh, can become successful entrepreneurs if it's a state of mind, if it's something that you can teach, if it's something that we need to invest uh, in high school, in universities. So my question is about the second part, if you think all people can be entrepreneurs. Tina, do you want to? Sorry, last question I'm going to answer. Okay, could you please repeat the, the, the question for Tina? Only the last sentences. <laughs> Only the last sentence. If you think all people can be entrepreneurs, and if you think should be more investment in education, entrepreneurship education. Yeah. Um, as the one who is uh, pro the motion, uh, uh, it, I think it's about the chicken and the egg. Uh, what's first? What's leading? 
is um, a digital uh, technology leading to be a successful entrepreneur or are some other skills uh, leading to be a successful entrepreneur? I'm agreed with my opponents that education is a very uh, valuable uh, um, word and it is uh, needed, especially in Europe, to educate our uh, youngsters in um, entrepreneurial behavior. You don't want to, be an to become an entrepreneur if you don't want to choose for it. But I think uh, it's very worthful for our economic development and also for our social sustainability to educate our uh, youngsters in um, uh, entrepreneurial behavior. And then uh, back to uh, the motion that digital technology is a very, very important aspect of being successful. Uh, uh, and it's, uh, that still stands strong, I think. Thank you. Orla, you want to add something? Yes, um, I would say that I firmly believe that everybody can become an entrepreneur, not necessarily through use of technology, yeah. but through the environment that's around them. I think that's how you become an entrepreneur. Going back to the Danish study I mentioned, um, of those children who were studied who'd gone through the entrepreneurial training programs, of those at the end of it, about 55% of them said quite confidently, yes, I can become an entrepreneur, I can do this, I can start up a business. But that jumped to about 65 or 66% of those children who knew entrepreneurs, who had been exposed to entrepreneurship, whose families were in business. So it's very much about influence, giving you the confidence as Amit said, to take that risk and to go for it. It's the old line of, you know, jump out and build a parachute on the way down. And I mean, to have that mindset, I think is, is very much determined by all of the influences. And that's why I think the entrepreneurial ecosystem is so important because it has to come from many different sources, from your family of origin, from the education system, from government policy, from society in general. I think when we get all of that piece right and we're very focused and when we're using opportunities to highlight entrepreneurship in the media, we're talking about it, we're putting those ideas out there all the time to young people to say, you know, do it, go for it. We'll give you the sports, we'll make it happen. But a lot of it has to come from within. I think it's personal responsibility as well. A lot of it has to be, you know, I want to do this, I want to contribute in this way. And I, I think that's a, the interesting piece. Okay. Thank you. Ilya, you want to follow up? Uh, the answer is yes and yes, <laughs> right? Yes, entrepreneurship can be learned and can be taught successfully. Yes, Europe should invest much more into teaching entrepreneurship. Just two facts. One is I graduated from a school of economics in Vilnius, six years, banking and finances was my major. Never ever in those six years I heard the word venture capital or VC, period. I do, second fact is I do often quite give uh, public uh, uh, keynotes and lectures in many Lithuanian and North Lithuanian universities. And a couple of weeks ago, I was giving a keynote to Business School of Economics in Lithuania, third year at all students. And when I asked how many of you can tell the difference between investment and credit, both are used to fund business, only four hand out of 400 raised. Now, if you're an entrepreneur, and nowadays, if you don't know what venture capital is, that you do not fund the business through credit, that you need to take an investment, you simply cannot really effectively build a business, period. So it's not rocket science. Uh, I say typically it would be enough, like one hour to give you the basics, you know, of how you build a modern entrepreneurs or startups, et cetera, and Silicon Valley model, et cetera. But you have to give that knowledge. That knowledge is lacking. It's being missed massively in European universities, many of them. And totally the opposite. When I was visiting uh, some of my friends in Silicon Valley, 12 years old kid explained to me what means Series A, Series B, the preferences on the shares, etc., and says, hey, you know, everybody knows that. Well, because we follow Mark Zuckerberg's story, we follow Sergey Brin's story, etc., everybody knows that. So everybody knows that, 12 years old kid, six years banking finances in university, and there is a massive difference in knowledge. So I think, yes, you can teach and learn entrepreneurship, and yes, Europe should invest much more into building specifically that skill in universities. Thank you. So, two quick questions. First of all, yeah, one from here and one from the lady. I don't forget you. Thank you very much and uh, congratulations for the nice panelists. Uh, I'm Andrea Stefanidis, the president of Young Entrepreneurs of Greece. 
I would like to give a small uh, new vision of the big debate that thanks to digital technology, we can support our national ecosystem to be connected and support young entrepreneurs, not just the young entrepreneurs itself, because we need research center, policy makers, universities, everybody to support the young entrepreneurs. Not everyone can be a successful entrepreneur, but all society members can have the entrepreneurial mindset. So digital technology will facilitate that, and we have to find all the stakeholders, solutions, how we can speed up this process. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. you want to comment? I, I, I think see you just reinforce why we're against the motion. Yeah, exactly. You know, technology is a commodity. It's all about having the right ecosystem. And you know, when we talk about techno you know, technology being the key, key factor, which was a question, the technology is the same with cloud, open system. Why is it everybody still refers to Silicon Valley as the ecosystem or Tel Aviv or Haifa? as the outsourcing arm of the US, because they have successfully created aspects of the ecosystem, the funding, the skill sets, the culture, all attributes to be a successful entrepreneur, not to launch just a cool company. So I agree with you. Thank you very much for supporting our view. And, and I think one other factor as well, and particularly for young people, is the idea of these hubs and hotspots. Because we all know what happens when they get in a room and they start bouncing ideas around. The energy that emerges and one will encourage the other. So when we have these hotspots and hot desking situations emerging in small towns and villages, enterprise centres, it's extraordinary what happens. If you put it in place, it's the old line from the movie, build it and they will come. You build the, the enterprise center, the hotspot, and the, the, the young people will gravitate towards it if they feel there's an energy. Now, the technology is very attractive. We know this. We see tiny, tiny infants in prams and they're doing this on their iPads. They're the digital natives, as Mark Prensky famously coined it, and they will be attracted so much to the, the, the technology already. That's why we don't really need to teach the technology. They know more about it already than we do. What we need to teach them are the other skills to put around it. That's my, my view. Okay, do you play with Team, Ma team B? No? <laughs> do you play with Team B? He just no. Joined team B. Are you he friends? Just no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the question from the lady? I think it's the last one. Eh? We are running out of time. Is Go the on. mic working? Yeah. My name is Katharina Kord. I'm the correspondent of the financial newspaper Handelsblatt. And Could I'd you like to speak up. Please. Yeah. My name is Katharina Kord. I'm the correspondent of the German financial newspaper Handelsblatt. And I'd like to know your opinion of the importance of public money, public funding grants for entrepreneurs. Because I didn't hear a lot about it, and we've just learned that actually Europe has more programs than the US, and obviously it's not the same result. And so, and yesterday also at the reception, some entrepreneurs said, I don't want to waste my time on asking for grants. I'd rather use the time to make good products. So, do you think, do we have enough programs? Maybe it's not that important how much money we put in there. So, an opinion on that. <laughs> it's an interesting question. I mean, can you get rid of public money with, through digital technology or still in it? I have a very firm opinion that uh, public money should not be used to directly fund entrepreneurs and companies. I have a very strong opinion against that. Although, although this is a pretty common practice in Europe to try to catch up with, with Silicon Valley, I don't believe for any reasons. Most important, it's socially unfair when the public for taxpayers for tax money takes the risk and then entrepreneurs take the success. But the bigger reason, I do not believe this is an effective way of using the money. Because if I've seen a lot of, say, government uh, officials who actually uh, sign the grants or allocate the money, etc. Believe me, like a private investor in Silicon Valley is responsible with his career for every single investment he does. A, he screens the companies really tough, like unless he does a proper due diligence, really believes in what you're selling, really is proven that you actually have the skills to build that, he will not put the money at, like in your company at all. Because if he doesn't, he fails with you, period. That's the end of his career. It's very tough. And second, after putting the money, he really has no choice but to follow the money. I mean, because he's personally responsible for that, uh -uh, he really watches day and night that we take a good use of that money. So the efficiency of using the money is extremely high. And that is not the case with a lot of European money. Believe me, I've seen a lot that's being put into companies 
typically, again, you are here probably visualize and, and realize how a lot of European processes are run, a set of checkbox. You know, I find it 100 companies allocated so many million, you know, I, I've set my goals. That's how a typical uh, institution that allocates the money works. So although, having said that, even though I do not believe in putting private or uh, public money into the companies or entrepreneurs individually, I believe in investing in infrastructure, in events, in ecosystem, in infrastructure, like internet connection, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's a much better use for public money than just, you know, just giving them to, to, uh, to actually individuals just, just to spend. And one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about that, again, I'm coming from Lithuania. As you know, Lithuania is one of the European countries uh, recently. And, and uh, believe it or not, as much as quarter of Lithuanian digital business is not about building products that could be used by individuals. It's about what they call acquiring European money just because the funds are available. So you look at the product like nobody needs it. I mean, some kind of weird system, platform, knowledge base, et cetera, that nobody ever will use. And you see the kind of money being put there just because, you know, it funds innovation, and you really feel sorry for that. So, unfortunately, I've seen too much of that, and I, again, I don't believe in that model. Okay, thank you. And also because we don't have so much public money left in Europe. <laughs> to, to, to do. I, I think we have to, you have just one question very quickly because we have to go to the vote. Please. Grazie. Thank you. Eh, saluto tutti, io sono Emilio Alfano, presidente Emilio di Confab Alfano. Industria Campania, I'm che rappresenta appunto Campania, le piccole e medie industrie campane. Uh, e io ho ascoltato fin dall'inizio right la relazione e gli illustri ospiti e il dibattito che si sta sviluppando. In questo momento ritengo sia moltissimo interessante, non poco. In argomento sulla tecnologia, Ritengo che la tecnologia sia un elemento importantissimo nel fare impresa, no, per il successo che poi viene chiaramente su ci sono altri, altri motivi ed altri elementi. Non dimentichiamo che la tecnologia si compone anche di comunicazione, l'impresa ha bisogno di comunicare e se prima per comunicare sosteneva dei costi altissimi, oggi le imprese tutte, di tutte le categorie hanno opportunità immense di poter comunicare col mondo in tempi rapidi ma innanzitutto a costi bassissimi. E poiché i costi rappresentano all'interno delle imprese un elemento elemento importante. Noi siamo in Europa, però devo dire che siamo in Europa ma l'Europa non è unita, come non è unita l'Italia. Se voi immaginate che in Italia abbiamo diciamo, tre grandi aree geografiche, nord, centro, sud. Vedete che fare impresa al sud costa più del nord. Un imprenditore che investe, che apre un'attività al sud, costa mediamente, e questa è proprio un'indagine un di non camere, costa un 20-25% in più. Perché? Perché qui abbiamo delle diseconomie rispetto al centro, al nord del paese. Il denaro costa di più, l'energia elettrica costa di più, ci sono altri fenomeni che chiaramente portano l'impresa a pagare di più. Ecco, la stessa cosa come avviene in Italia, sta avvenendo in Europa, perché non abbiamo regioni europee dove l'imposizione fiscale è inferiore all'Italia, non abbiamo secondo me il top, il massimo di imposizione fiscale e non è, non è tollerabile, quindi esorteremo più a dedicarsi ad equilibrare le capacità di mettere le imprese in competizione anziché su altri argomenti che chiaramente non ci porteranno mai a essere uniti in Europa. Grazie, se permette considero questo come l'intervento conclusivo della, della nostra tavola rotonda. Uh, I declare uh, uh, close the debate, on the debate and uh, it was big actually. <laughs> uh, congratulations on the, on the speakers. And uh, I will ask for the vote, as I said before, so you can use your phone or tablet to vote for or against for team A against team B. The motion, you remember the motion very well at this point, this assembly believes that thanks to digital technology everyone can become a successful entrepreneur. 
uh, if you vote for team A, you say yes. If you vote for team B, to team B, you say no. I give you two minutes to vote. Yeah, I know. Okay, I think, I think that unfortunately we are experiencing uh, technical difficulties. Uh, okay, no, it, it looks like it's working. You try. Okay, it's working. Be confident, it's working. We are in Naples after all. Everything works in Naples. So voting is closed. Okay, we are computing the figures. Couple of minutes, I will, I will say you. With the winners, the winners. I like the music. Where is the music? Good. I take bets, huh? Who's winner? Okay, we have the results. Uh, quite a surprise, I must say. Um, team B is the winner by a small majority, uh, 73. <laughs> against 27. So by a, by a large majority, the assembly believes that while digital technology is obviously more, very important, 
uh, it is not enough. And we must do more to educate potential entrepreneurs in the vital skills they need to succeed. And applause to all our speakers because they, they did a good job. Thank you very much indeed. Come back next, next year. Maybe you win next year. <laughs> okay, so that's it, ladies and gentlemen, for this morning. Uh, when you come back, after, first, one moment, I have to say something. When you come back after the networking lunch, oh, this is a great so Olympic nice. Games. <laughs> uh, when you come back uh, from the lunch provided by the Italy uh, presidency, which you will find located in the lobby, the assembly will have been divided up uh, to accommodate the entrepreneurship forum and two policy sessions. Please be in your place for your chosen session by 5 to 2, 13.55. You may also attend one of the meet the expert sessions that will kick off at uh, uh, half past four and visit the most excellent Entrepreneur Expo. After attending your chosen afternoon sessions, please be back here in Galatea by six o'clock for the European Enterprise Promotion Award ceremony. Buon appetito. Buon appetito. Grazie.